Welcome back to the Early Way In podcast. We head to Las Vegas Apex this weekend for UFC Vegas 87. Co-main event, Vitor Petrino at Tyson Pedro at light heavyweight. In our main event, uh, Jair Rosenstroik always seems to headline these mediocre cards, man. Taking on Shamil Gaziev um, at heavyweight, five-rounder. Only 11 fights for us to break down. I won't waste any time, man. Let you recap a good night from us both last week, and we'll get down to breaking these fights. Yeah, dude. I love it when we're both in the green coming off of a fight night. We'll take a look over at your card first. Uh, 4-0 for your straight picks, man. You went uh, underdog on Brian Ortega, Manuel Torres. You put one and a half units on. Aoni Barcelos, you put one and a half units on. That one was looking a little sketch yeah. up until that yeah. third round. But uh, it just seems like if he would – go to his uh, grappling sooner. He would make yeah. easy work of a lot of the division. Um, Luis Rodriguez over Denise Bondard. That was another good bet at plus money. Uh, Zell Huber to win, which that that was a, a parlay. Rosas. Got, Rosas, yeah, that's what Watch got out. out. Might have got lucky. Maybe so. Maybe so. Um, almost a, a unit profit off of that, just the straight bet on Zell Huber, which was probably the play, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Moreno Naimov, uh, the Moreno fight. Man, I love Moreno, but he didn't win that fight. I'm glad that Roy Val got the rightful nod on the judges' scorecards. Yeah. Um, and then uh, it seems like all, all the sprinkle plays that you had just didn't didn't pan out, didn't yeah. get there. But uh, you ended up plus 2.21 units on the night. Um, definitely solid with the 4-0 straight bets. Uh, exact opposite over on my card, 0 and 2 on straight bets. Um, not mad at the bets necessarily. Mateus Mendonca, I thought that he got, I thought that he got, should have gotten the uh, the nod against Jesus Aguilar, but it is what it is. At the end of the day, it was an extremely close fight, and I was paying juice, so I can't be too upset about it. Um, and then Daniel Lacerda versus Edgar Chavez. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, one last time. Yeah, I took a stab, and he looked like a plus 390. I'm thinking about a couple other stabs this week, and hopefully they'll put up a little better fight than Daniel Lacerda did. It seemed like he wanted out of that fight. Um, I had three scorecards, no actions bet on the on my card, and uh, I liked all of them, to be honest with you. I look at the Prado versus Zell Huber. Uh, the only way that Prado's winning that fight is by catching Zell Huber, and uh, I knew that he was tough enough to get it to the judges' scorecards, so um, that, that one ended up being a void. Ortega scorecards, no action. Um, you know, hell, that one almost lost. He almost got finished <laughs> in that first round, um, but I was happy that he, he did end up getting that job done. We were both on Ortega. I, I like that. Um, Fight ends by sub on the initial fight of the night. I think we were both on a submission on that fight, and we didn't even get to see it play out. Um, and then Puelez scorecards, no action. Um, another one where it, I felt like it was a sub or bust, and uh, for us, Z, I'm not really known as a, a finisher. So yeah, uh, that one ended up being a void. And then Barcelos by submission at plus 430. That was probably nice. my best bet on the card and and also saved my night. Um <clears throat> Ended up plus 1.47 units. And, uh, yeah, it wasn't a huge night for either of us, but certainly not one that we can complain about. That's right. Uh, moving on to the first bout of the night, it's Loik Radzibov taking on Abdul Karim Al-Salwadi. Um, let's see. Salwadi, he's only 28 years old, coming off of his contender series win over George Hardwick. Um, I know he's got a really good camp out there at Fortis MMA. Um, they game plan a lot for their opponents. And, yeah. um, you know, I'm curious what they have in, in store for Loik Radzibov here, who I think is a, you know, a serviceable fighter. He had a pretty couple tough matchups right off the bat against Esteban Ribovic, who was undefeated at the time, and then following up with Mateusz Rebecki. Split one and one in those fights. Um, didn't really expect much different in the Mateus Rebecki fight after watching a couple of his fights, man, like he's going to be an issue for a lot of people in that right. division. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not hating on Loic for losing that fight. Um, as far as this matchup though, I want to play Loic really bad because I think that he's, uh, comparable to Abdul Kareem here in a lot of different aspects of MMA. Um, but I am struggling to find out where he edges out, uh, Abdul Sawadi here. Uh, mm -hmm. 
for me, it's it's one of those fights where I, I do see it being very close. And I think that Loic is tough enough and has enough experience to make this fight close. Um, but I think that this fight is probably going over and I could see this fight being a, a close decision. So um, I'm looking at the over. I think it's like plus or minus 165 or something like that for the over two and a half. And that would be how I would play this fight. Um, although I, I might not find that on my actual card, you know? Yeah. We see the fight uh, pretty similar, man. I think this is one of only two or three fights where we have the favorite under like minus 300. Uh, so I think that's kind of kind of wanting itching people to get involved this week. I kind of I see people on both sides this week on Twitter. One, one more thing to, to point out is, you know, Loic is coming off of the first finish of his career. And that's mm-hmm. that's always a weird spot. You don't really know how they're going to react whenever that happens. So this that might be another reason why we how where we see Loic try and slow down the pace of this fight and extend it. But, yeah. I'm, I'm totally with you. I think the fight does go late. Um, with Al, Al Swati, man, I was super impressed with the George Hardwick fight. Like, you talked about where they where he comes from um, and for his MMA and their game planning. Like, I have that written down in the notes as well. The guy looks like he has a very high fight IQ. He looks like he does game plan for his opponents. And he he what I have written down is he almost reminds me of a Bilal Muhammad. He knows he's not the most athletic guy out there, um, but he knows he has to be very technical. He knows he has to come in with a smart game plan, and you don't see him deviate from it. He was very happy to scoot around the outside. You could tell he had really good timing on his right hand. He knew George Hardwick liked to go to the body, and he was able to time his right hand. He looked like he had some sneaky power was stopping George in his tracks, and you know, even late in the fight, mixed in a takedown after a, a long striking fight. So Man, I, I honestly, I really liked what I saw from the guy. Um, in terms of Loic, I think there could be a small edge in grappling, maybe a small edge in finishing upside earlier. Um, and I do consider him to probably the, to be the more durable guy, despite being the one coming off of the the knockout last time himself. But I'm kind of with you, man. I think Rebecca is going to be a huge issue. You know, stifled him early with the calf kicks, and then probably one of the better paces at 155 of anybody is Mateus Rebecca. So it kind of wore on him. Um, I'm so I'm so glad that you started off the fight card talking about the over two and a half, something that we talked about focusing <laughs> yeah. in on this year, something that we got a really, really high ROI on. Um, I think the fight goes over probably about 68% of the time. You can get it for anywhere between 60 and 62% of the time. So I personally do plan on um, likely having the over on my card. Um, maybe somewhat of a hedge to that. Um, I think Loic finish only is, is a pretty good prop. I've seen it still floating around at like plus 100. I think he's the side who were to get a finish here, um, if anybody does. But, yeah, I, I do think I'm going to play the over two and a half, man. I'm glad that you, you brought what that up. What if he can't take the power anymore, though, you know? That's that's my worry. That's the only thing keeping me off of it is how is he going to respond to getting finished, you know? Yeah, it, it is a tricky spot coming off of uh, – coming off of the the TKO loss, but I know a lot of his fights prior going to decision, he's been five rounds. And then, you know, when you look at Al Swati, he's last, what, three of the last four or something has gone to decision. He's not, I don't think he has the most power. I don't think he really steps on the gas that much. He likes to skirt around the outside. Yeah. Here's another thing is it does seem to be a pretty popular dog being on the week this week. Um, and yeah. I think that that is because of the line in general. You know, the, there's a ton of heavy favorites on this line or on this uh, card, and you have yeah. to take like a hard stance if you're going to take a plus 250 or better dog. This is a dog where I think people are seeing that it could be a close fight and they want to bet Luik. Um, But I really do think that we've kind of hit the nail on the head as far as this fight going the over. It's going to be a closely contested fight. People are probably going to get upset when Loic doesn't get the decision win, but as long as we got the over, I like that. Good stuff, man. Moving down to 135, Vinicius Oliveira taking on newcomer, short notice, Bernardo Sopai. I um, just, truth be told, hadn't had a ton of time to dig into the Sopai side, uh, but I was going to bet Vinicius Oliveira against the uh, um, Giannis Gamori, the Frenchman. Uh, yeah, Giannis, man, dude looks like he is – just straight being honest with you, man. Looks like he's happy USADA's gone. Looks like he's juiced to the gills online. Um, I think he has legit power. Um, and I didn't think, you know, he's very wild. I didn't think Giannis Gamori was going to be able to take advantage of that. Some of the stuff that I see from Sopai, um, he does look sharp on the feet. He does look like he has a little bit of wrestling to him. And I do believe the last time I looked, 
um, dude was getting ready for a fight um, next Saturday on the yeah. 2nd. So, mm-hmm. you know, it, he's not coming off the couch. He's actually been in fight camp and everything. So, I, th- I, I truth be told, I think, I don't know. I think he could be a live underdog um, just because I think he's a little bit more technical than Vinicius Oliveira is and he may, maybe could catch him. But I've lost all the value on it. Open like plus 190 or something, and now the line might even flip before fight time. So something I just kind of want to dig in, uh, tape. But seeing that all the value is gone on Sapai, it kind of leads me to want to look at the Vinicius Oliveira side a little bit more since that's the guy who I was originally tending on betting. So I, I don't have the strongest opinion on this one. I'm still going to. I'm going to side with Vinicius Oliveira, who I originally was wanting to play. That's kind of how I feel, man. I think that Sapai has a, a solid highlight reel. And, um, you know, just him having already been prepared for a fight this weekend, um, coming in with the power that he has, you just don't see that very often at 135 pounds. Um, so I think that he's a popular dog for that reason alone. Um, Vinicius Oliveira, it, Honestly, neither one of these guys have proven enough for me to want to bet them um, in the spot, you know, but I, I have to agree with you that I, I think that this, you know, they're bringing in Sapai here to keep Vinicius Oliveira on the card. I think the UFC is kind of trying to highlight Vinicius Oliveira here, um, but I do expect Sapai to be one of these guys who are game. Um, so I expect kind of a, a close fight, maybe a, a Mendonca Aguilera Aguilar fight from last week, something similar to that. And uh, for me, it's it's just going to be a layoff fight. And hopefully we get, you know, Sapai showcases some of his talents and we get just another solid 135-pounder to add to the roster. Yeah. Uh, moving up to the middleweight, Christian Leroy Duncan taking on Claudio Ribeiro. Um, not sure if the odds were meant to open Christian Leroy Duncan, but they had him at, at plus 180, and now he's all the way down to minus 300 or more. Mm-hmm. Um, both of these guys, man, they're they're cleaning up the bottom of the barrel. You know, the, their wins are are Dennis Tulillian, Dusko Todorovic, and uh, Ugly Joseph Holmes, and uh, don't really get much from that. Um, I like the way that Christian Leroy Duncan fights. I th- think that he's a little susceptible to getting hit himself, which is why I would be worried against somebody like Claudio Ribeiro. Ribeiro doesn't put together the best game plan, in my opinion. He, he you know, he's a one shot type of guy, but he's so fast and athletic that if he is landing those shots, he can do some significant damage. And the fact that Christian Leroy doesn't have the best defense makes me timid to play him at these odds. Although I would say that Duncan does have a, um, uh, an edge and and just striking as a whole. I think that he's probably the, the better striker, but this is one of those fights where I could make a a case for Ribeiro, but I I think it probably comes inside the distance if I was going to bet him. So um, I don't really know how I'm going to look at this fight because as much as I, you know, I'd like to go back to last week and do the scorecards, no action. There's a lot of upside for Duncan to get this done inside the distance as well. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't think that's the spot either. I'm sure that the unders are juiced. Um, so for me, it's probably a sprinkle on Ribeiro inside the distance because of the current odds and because of the upside I see for him inside the distance um, or a complete layaway, layoff fight for me. Yeah, about a about a 5 6% difference. I, I'm on Christian Leroy Duncan on a parlay at minus 225. I um, I, I just think he's the better overall fighter in pretty much every aspect of this of, of the fight truth truth be told i think he's has lost a little bit of hype after the armin loss uh you know taking his first l um but i think the line now is pretty appropriate i think he's a far you know guy who's still improving young extensive amateur background the guy's been five rounds um i think he's much cleaner much more technical on the feet has grappling upside and i, I feel like he's a far better superior cardio um uh, has a far superior uh, cardio in this matchup. Ribeiro, you kind of already touched on it, kind of like one of these one-shot guys. Uh, he does have the power edge. I guess you maybe see him, his chances of landing it a little bit little bit more than I think he has here. Uh, his leg kicks, pretty nice, more of a fast twitch guy, but I think he dies out pretty late. Um, I, I think I think Christian Leroy Duncan will probably find the finish in rounds two or three on on the CDL side this week or CLD side this week. 
Uh, back down to 135, Javid Bashrat versus Eamon Zahabi. Probably not too exciting of a fight, man, just truth be told. It probably goes to decision, like 75% or something, maybe even more. Uh, both guys are pretty technical out at range on the feet, but I, I just think Basharat, again, kind of like the, the fight we just talked about, I think Basharat's pretty superior in every aspect of this fight. The Basharat brothers in general, very well-rounded guys. I like the way Javid moves at range, uses his distance management really well. Um, those way more volume than Zahabi. I think he's got the better gas tank than Zahabi has the ability to mix in his grappling here. Um, doesn't always, you know, I guess have the biggest sense of urgency. Doesn't always step on the gas pedal for his finishes in the UFC like he did on the regional scene, but, um, you know, I'm even comfortable with him backing him to a decision here just cause I think he's got, you know, more volume wrestling cardio upside. Um, I'm pretty high on Javid to get through Eamon Zahabi this week. Yeah, man, Eamon Zahabi, kind of a, a fighter that I've always had difficulty capping. He's 36 years old now, um, and he comes out of a good gym at TriStar up in Canada. And something about him is I, I feel like he's not a very athletic fighter, and so it, yeah. it you know forces him to be cerebral in there and, and formulate a game plan and uh, almost slow it down to his pace. You know, you talked about not having a lot of volume, but it does seem to be like, um, a Neil Magny effect where something about his his game slows down the pace to to where he can make it close. Um, Cause you're right. He's not really keen on finishing, although he has, you know, found a couple of finishes in his last few fights. I don't really think that that's um, who Eamon Zahabi is. Uh, I, I could be wrong um, on the Javid Basharat side. I, think that he's still kind of searching for that first UFC finish. I think he is going to try and push it to the ground earlier than he has in his past fights um, with somebody as dangerous on the feet as Zahabi, or at least as, as technically sound on the feet as Zahabi. Okay. I, I think that it'd be in Basharat's best interest to try and exploit his advantages on the ground. Um, so uh, one of these fights where, you know, you're getting a minus 800, there's probably not a, ton of great lines but the basharat by submission is sitting at like five to one and um he hasn't seen that in the ufc yet and i just feel like zahabi or um yeah zahabi might be the, the fighter that he can capitalize on his ground skills just like uh, i yeah. think his brother's last fight or the fight before i called his first fight or first submission in the ufc around the same number and i think that this uh this is probably going to warrant another bet for me here i like it Moving on to the lightweights. Dang, Ladovic Klein versus my yeah. boy, AJ Cunningham, man. Yeah. Um, this is another one like the Vinicius Oliveira fight. Um, Ladovic Klein's on this card because the UFC wants to get him a fight, man. You know, they, they yeah. scramble together to find him a last-minute opponent. And luckily, AJ Cunningham stepped in to save the day. Now, AJ Cunningham, um, like... If I'm not mistaken, I think he was also scheduled to fight maybe in a week. Um, they've removed it off of Tapology, but I think um, that he was also kind of in fight camp only a couple weeks away from a fight, a scheduled fight. Um, so shout out to him for taking this fight. He's a really tough dude, and he's gonna need it. In, he's gonna need it in this fight. I don't really see yeah. him having the skill set to to really you know, get the fight where he needs it outside of making it dirty um, to make it dirty. He's going to have to close the distance. Ladovic Klein, mean high, mm -hmm. mean head kick, uh, mean striking. He'll probably feign him uh, for the first couple minutes and then throw some pretty devastating shots. I expect Klein to get the finish. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to find a spot on it though. He's minus 800, 900 here. Probably not going to parlay that weird mm -hmm. card this week, man. Yeah, I know we bet AJ Cunningham as a dog on a uh, on contender series, and you know while he didn't really make the fight close, fights for your money, you know. Yeah, that's what absolutely. you want when you that's what you want when you bet an underdog. Uh, I feel like if he just doesn't get the fight to the mat, uh, he's in for for an ass whooping. Just truth be told, you know, Ladova hits super hard on the feet, those nasty body kicks. You talked about the head kick he slept a couple guys with. Um, he's really good in the clinch and. Yeah, I um I think AJ might be tough enough to take it in round one or something, but I think eventually the damage body kicks gonna wear on him. I feel like Ladova gets him out of there in, in two or three. Um, 
something. As long as AJ can take it, he'll be in there. But eventually, the body's got to go. I feel like I feel like that might be what happens. I feel like he's so tough to body kick or something that gets him out of there. Maybe a referee mercy stoppage up against the cage or something. I mean, you could kind of draw some comparisons to Cunningham and Nate Landwehr. I was thinking being, the same thing. <laughs> if he's there in round three. Tough enough, if he could drag this out to round three and just make it a yeah. dog fight, but he's got to get through a ton of shit to do, to do yeah. that. So, yeah. I'm on, uh, I'm on a little Dovic Klein side as well, man. Uh, prelim main event, your boy Eric Anders taking on Jamie Pickett. Last chance to fade old Jamie Pickett, man. Uh, Eric's going to send him packing. Yeah. Typically, you know, when you look at Anders, a guy who's not won a lot of fights lately, looks to kind of be toward at the tail end of his career at 36 years old. Um, not typically a spot that you like to back, but I think he's the far better fighter here. And I love fading Jamie Pickett at whatever the price tag is, man. I, I feel like Anders is the way better striker, ton of the finishing upside here, far stronger in the clinch, can hold him on the cage, can drag him down to the mat. You see him training. Um, with the Philly guys, you see him going out to Arizona, doing all these grappling matches. Eric Anders is still taking his career serious at this point. When you look on a line, I don't necessarily see the th- same from Jamie Pickett, who's basically a 500 fighter at this point, lost six of his last eight fights. And I, I mean, truth be told, man, when you're losing to Jordan Wright and Dennis Tululian, I'm willing to play Eric Anders at just about any price tag. I, I, I Eric Anders by any way he wants to, man. Knockout, submission, decision, and this is his fight. Dude, I mean, here's the thing. Just looking at it from an outside perspective, this is the most amount of people I've ever seen say Eric Anders is a lock for any fight ever. The dude, <laughs> I mean, he's one in four his last five. And although Jamie Pickett's overall record is closer to 500, Eric Ender's like UFC record is below 500. Like he is not a great fighter, man. I I feel like he, like uh, Devin Clark, um, a lot of the times whenever he finds success, it's when it's when he's able to implement his game plan for the entire fight, and he's dog tired after he does it. Even in his best wins, he's still on the brink of death, in my opinion. I feel like he just has to overwork to be successful. Yes, I agree. Jamie Pickett is the guy that he could implement that game plan on. I just, I cannot trust Eric Anders at this price tag. And I feel like, you know, if, if uh, a few months ago, if I, I told you or anybody, Hey, Eric Anders will be fighting somebody as a minus 400, put him in a parlay. You laugh at me, dude. I feel like it's <laughs> circumstantial just with the guy he's fighting. And although I cannot make a case for Jamie Pickett, um, I'm, I'm laying off of this fight, man. This just seems like one of those hindsight 2020 don't put Eric Anders in your parlays, but I swear to no. you, it's I, I've heard the most confident takes over on Anders. He should be minus 1000 blah, 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 blah. So I'm excited to see it. I've never seen Eric Anders look minus 1,000, but, but I'm excited to see it Saturday, dude. The time he did, he got disqualified for an illegal yeah, name or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, moving on to the main card. In the flyweight division, Matt Schnell taking on Steve Urseg. Uh, You know, this looks like – this looks like Urseg – um let's see the yeah price tag minus 370 Urseg, he's significantly younger um quicker more athletic uh you know at a different point in his career uh schnell he, he puts on really exciting fights but he's one of the chinniest fighters on the roster um yeah. i'm pretty sure that steve Urseg's uh quick enough that he's gonna beat uh schnell to the punch and unless Schnell could get something going on the ground, I, I, he'll probably get caught. Um, I don't know. Urseg has some sneaky submissions. So I wouldn't be surprised if he caught him on the feet and then locked up a submission while um, Schnell is, is kind of rocked. That's how I could yep. see this fight going down. But, um, yeah, I think Urseg's probably the rightful favorite. He's bet out of proportion, though, like everybody else on the card. Yeah, great fight to kick off the main card. I think this is a fight kind of flying under the radar. I think it's one of the higher level fights on the car, truth be told. Uh, I think both fighters are really, really skilled. Matt Schnell, 
man, hard not to even bring up the Sumu Darji fight when you talk about the guy. Comeback of the year, round of the year. Uh, could, could listen to DC's commentary on that fight over and over again. Uh, round two was awesome, but man, dude took an absolute whooping in that one. Uh, turns around, um, gets Nicolau, gets stopped in that fight. Ref kind of takes him, lets him take a little whooping at the end of that fight as well. Um, you know, Matt Schnell's got skills like you talked about. He's not bad on the feet. Um, very good submission grappler. You can't question the guy's heart. Um, chin just doesn't allow him to, you know, to stay in some of these fights. Uh, the other day I was kind of thinking back uh, from the season of the Ultimate Fighter that he was on, and the only guys left in the UFC, um, Kai Car France, Pantoja, and Moreno. So, you know, Matt Schnell's still kind of been keeping his thing going in the UFC. Uh, might lose a few, but finds his way off to win a couple as well. Uh, with Erseg, I feel like the ground game is um, is negated in this fight. I don't think Matt Schnell has much advantages in, um, in that area. And so a fight that's played out on the feet, I'm with you. I think Erseg is just a little too sharp, a little too young, a little too quick to the punch. Um, and I see it going the same way. I think he hurts Snell on the feet and locks up a guillotine or something. So I like Steve Erseg, clever sub, way I see it going as well. Moving up a weight class to Bantamweight. Uh, Umar, ta- Umar and Umar Gamedov taking on Bexet, Almakan. You know, I know they're wanting Umar to really headline this card. Seems like the probably the most avoided fighter um, in the Bantamweight division. Um, crazy high on this guy, just like a lot of people are. He is a Nurmagomedov that can compete on the feet. Um, he is not lost on the feet by no means, but his his wrestling and, and top control, and it, it's incredible. And, um, you know, Habib, I guess, toward the end of his career, he, he was kind of finding some submissions, but I felt like he was uh, – you know, primarily some ground and pound, where uh, I really do like Umar's submission ability. So I feel like he's going to be able to get this guy down, be able to submit this guy. Beck's at 26 years old, man, 18 pro fights. I'll give it to you. I think he's only been to the scorecards one time. Um, and when you see, like, 13 knockouts, that is the way that you have to beat these Dagestani guys. Like Islam, like Khabib, like Umar, like it's it's got to be like the Adrian – Adriano Martinez fight or whatever. Like you're going to have to clip him on the feet. Um, and the dude's got a ton of knockouts and he looks pretty quick. Uh, I just don't, I don't think he's going to find it on Saturday. I, I think he gets taken down and probably subbed in one or two. I told you I was going to look at the under one and a half at plus money. And then they opened up fight doesn't go the distance at minus 150. So might be a trap only having to pay minus 150 when there's a minus like 1300 favorite. But um, I like Umar to find the submission here, man. Hello, dude. I want to hate Umar so bad. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know what it is, but I, I don't really want him to find the same success Khabib did. I don't know what that <laughs> is about, to be honest with you. This Bexat dude, maybe it's just because of the, the competition that they're giving him, dude. Uh, yeah. Bexat, I think that he's a serviceable MMA fighter, you know. He'll make a, a solid UFC caliber fighter, um, but this is just kind of a ridiculous debut against uh umar i if anything if he were to get this fight to the judges scorecard i would count it as a win for Bexat. you know what i'm saying like yeah. I, I think that that would be a moral victory for Bexat and uh, a deserved one if he can get this to the scorecards um but yeah I, I expect umar to to piece him up and not really play around with somebody as dangerous on the feet as Bexat. so uh, i expect a submission rather early as well um Moving up, we go down a weight class to the flyweights where we see Alex Perez taking on Muhammad Mukhaev. And uh, I meant to actually talk to you about that. Mukhaev, he's probably going to get the push after this for the title, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, you can get him at plus 800 to hold to, to be the champion at the end of the year. And so it's like, I feel like if you expect him to win against Perez, you're getting a plus 800 ticket on him against Pantoja. He's probably going to be that though against Pantoja. Like I think Pantoja <laughs> probably walks through Makayev here, but uh, I don't know. He's got to get through Alex Perez first. Alex Perez, yeah. he, you know, he's one of these killer be killed type of fighters, man. Um, I feel like, you know, exactly how the fight's going to go after the first two and a half minutes. Um, He's been just plagued with injuries and pullouts, and um, that that can't be a good thing. Um, he's now past 30 years of age, so 
if he shows up to the scales and, and looks decent, I think that he'd be a great test for Mohamed Mukhaev at this point in his career. Um, Mukhaev, you know, I think he's, we've seen him go through adversity already. Um, he's gotten through them and he's on a, a three fight finish streak, man. You know, like there's, it might not be against the best level of competition, but he um, is doing what I need him to be able to do to, to back him. I, I think that, I think that he's the the pick here. I, I don't have much, you know, actually analysis of the fight, but I've got Muhammad and Mikhaev here. I don't really expect Alex Perez to make weight or even show up. So until that happens, that's a, you know, it's a layoff fight for me. Mikhaev's the pick though. Yeah, man. Um, you know, as he climbs the ranks, um, and you continue to see these big favorite price tags and you look back and see him giving up rounds, um, you know, down two rounds to Tim Elliott, needing the finish in, in Abu Dhabi against him. You see him comprom- in compromising positions to Fielho um, and Malcolm Gordon. It, do- it does make you a little bit weary to lay these kind of chalk price tags on him as he's continuing to climb the ranks. But um, I feel like the UFC knows what they're doing here. Um, I do feel like Alex Perez is going to show up here. He's just got a ton of red flags around him, man. Uh, very inactive, struggles with the scales like you talked about. His submission defense is, is pretty terrible. Quick to tap, kind of panics when he gets put in bad spots. And I feel like Muhammad will put him in bad spots on the mat here. Um, uh, both guys, a lot of their fights do play out um, on the mat. And I just feel like I can take the younger, faster guy with better cardio who has the easier weight cut. You know, I, I feel like – a I, I'm really not counting out another Muhammad Mukayev round three finish here. I think that's completely on the table again. So I like Muhammad Mukayev round two or three submission and get the job done. Yeah. So um, another thing I wanted to touch on is the under. Like uh, like I said, uh, Perez, kill or be killed type of fighter. And uh, Mukayev has the ability to push the pace even late in the fight. Uh, you're getting like minus 133 on fight doesn't go the distance. It is flyweight, so, you know, betting juiced flyweight unders probably is negative EV. Uh, but this seems like a fight where um, that's pretty likely to happen. I think I'm, I'm thinking with you, brother. Uh, not a horrible number. Co-main event, taking a bit of a step up uh, to some big boys for these last two. We're in uh, light heavyweight division. We have undefeated Vitor Petrino, 10-0, taking on Tyson Pedro. Um, you know, truth be told, I really like Vitor Petrino. I bet on him in a lot of his fights so far in the UFC. Um, I think he's one of the better prospects at light heavyweight in the UFC. Um, his frame, his athleticism, uh, I think the guy's very, very gifted there. Fast, powerful. Um, when this guy touches you, a lot of guys do not seem to be able to take it. Um, he doesn't really have a skill set that like jumps like really jumps off the page at you, but he's shown me that he can win by TKO. He's shown me he can ground you, he can submit you, he can win by decision. Um, I think he got, the guy is very cerebral. Um, I think he's smart. He doesn't go chasing the finish. He doesn't go gassing himself out. Um, kind of lets the fights come to him and and just you know sometimes is, is too big and too strong and too athletic for these guys, and, and it works for him. On the side with Tyson Pedro, um, you know, from the guy who kind of came in hot beating Paul Craig and Khalil Roundtree, he, he's kind of taken a step back, man. You know, losing to OSP and Shogun. And then even when you come back from the layoff, you haven't been tested. It's like Harry Hunsucker and, and very low level guys, Anton Tercali. Um, You're losing to Modestus Bokowskis. I like Tyson Pedro's, I guess. I guess I like his chances early in this fight relative to what the line is. Tyson Pedro's never won a fight outside of round one, and you can get stupid prices on his round one numbers. Um, But as this fight progresses, I do think Vitor Petrino really starts to take over. I think he's the one that can end this fight with one shot. I think he can take over with the cardio and the wrestling late. Um, Really high on the undefeated prospect in Vitor Petrino. I don't think his O gets taken on Saturday. Um. Yeah, MMA math, you know, that adds up, you know. <laughs> as mm-hmm. far as Tyson Pedro as a fighter, I feel like he's somebody who's constantly, consistently, like, underperformed with his expectations. You know, you yeah. see him come in at minus 600, 800, and um, it, 
you know, if he's not getting that first round finish, like you said, you don't really see much after that. So it's then hard to start lining him as such big of a favorite because you know that his winning potential is pretty limited. Um, and then against Anton Turk- Turkali, um, he's near even. You think it's going to be a test and he blows through him again. So, mm-hmm. you know, now is the very first time that you're getting him as an underdog against somebody that, I'll, that he'll probably have some success against in round one. I mean, Victor. Petrino, in my head, you know, he's got a ton of round one finishes, but from what I've seen, he kind of likes to download information, you know, he's obviously powerful the entire way through, um, but it does seem like he, um, there's a feeling out process for him, and he, I don't think that that's going to be a gift that he can um, use against somebody like Tyson Pager, who starts as hot as he does. Um, So like I said, it's like, you know, now we're getting plus 250 on somebody who normally um, is a is a pretty heavy favorite. Um, he's not undersized by any means. It just like I said, I just feel like he hasn't lived up to the expectations, which is why he's such a big underdog here. Um, it's it's just tough to cap a guy who's only winning in round one. Um, but I do think that Petrino, like I said, he he's not starting fast enough for me to think that Tyson Pedro can't catch him. And because he's only beaten. <laughs> you know, Anton Turkali, Prakniao, and Bukowskis. I mean, I understand that the light heavyweight division isn't as deep as a lot of the other divisions, but none of those wins means that much to me. Um, so in this spot and probably the most difficult fight of his of his career, um, I think that, you know, it's a I think it's a little bit disrespectful that he was the same favorite against Prakniao and Bukowskis as he is against Pedro here. That's kind of what I'm having difficulty getting over. So um, I like Tyson. If I'm going to play Pedro, I'm going to play him inside the distance. Um, I, I like him for this price tag. I think if, the, if we played this fight out 100 times, though, that Petrino is the rightful favorite. Yeah, it doesn't go the distance. It's minus 225, uh, <clears throat> just under 70%, and they finish inside the distance over 80%. So there's a big Doesn't that sound just like the biggest trap ever, dude? Like it, it does, but very often, not very often, are we? Are you sitting with thirteen points, a thirteen percent, you know, under their their average? Kind of the true. same for uh, same for the main event that we'll talk about, the under one and a half. Um, yes, you know, it, it was sitting at uh, minus one ninety, so it, you know, it was only at like sixty seven percent, and it's like a it's like eighty three percent. These guys hit the under one and a half, so. Talk about that fight. Yeah, little little trappy for sure. We got Biggie Boy Jorinzo Rosenstroik, who um, I think I saw something where he might have he's he might have the most main events in heavyweight currently. I could be wrong, but I think it's something like that. Like he has like it wouldn't goals. shock me if yeah, it's not well, Sean Strickland, it's Biggie Boy. <laughs> that's exactly right, um, King of the Apex, dude. So yeah. Jorinzo Rosenstroik taking on Shamil Gaziev, who's twelve and zero. Um, a little unproven. Uh, I think a lot of people are scared to take the shot on it. You know, we've seen in the past three weeks, four out of the last five weeks, something like that, the main event dogs are coming up or showing out. And, uh, I don't know why, but I think people are a little afraid to play Gaziev here. Like in, in my head, barring the, um, you know, first round little check left hook that Jorinzo Rosenstroik has whenever people try and close the distance. Barring Rosenstroik catching Gaziev with that exact shot, I think that this is a fucking wash for Gaziev, man. I think he can get the fight to the mat. When he does get the fight to the mat, I think he'll absolutely um, dominate Rosenstroik, who, in my opinion, will is a kickboxer now and will be a kickboxer when he dies, man. He's not making many improvements at 35 years old. Um, Gaziev just a little bit more well-rounded. I just hope he doesn't think that he can stand with a with a world-class kickboxer like Rosenstruik because he does have all the tools to be a minus one thousand here, which is why we're both on Gaziev here um, yep. for a pretty decent price tag, uh, minus one thirty-five, and he's getting up there at like minus one sixty. I think anything under minus two hundred is honestly a gift. Hoping it plays out that way, and um, I'm doubtful that we get a price tag like this on Gaziev moving forward against a striker. So, yeah, uh, man, I just was looking at topology. Correct me if I'm wrong. They, they used to have Rosenstroik at like six, four, right? 
Like, um, they have him at 6'2 yeah, now. And yeah, I feel like no, he definitely that, used yeah. to have him at like 6'4 or something. Mm-hmm. Starting to realize he's definitely not as big as they used to have him listed. I think guys you have um, going to be a whole lot bigger than him, a whole lot stronger than him. Um, it's funny, you know, I'm pretty sure his fight, I, I can go back and look real quick. I'm pretty sure his fight um, last time out with old, um, with old Martin Budai mm-hmm. opened up the card. I think it was the first fight of the night. And here it he was. is now heading. And now he's headlining his next card. So it's got to be like the quickest turnaround and the quickest, the biggest jump up on a card. Um, you know, I'm not just overlooking Jarzino Rosenstroy. The guy is a veteran at, at this point. He has a speed advantage over most heavyweights, and he's proven that he's dangerous to the last second. Um, but I've never really been a Rosenstroy believer, man. I've, I've faded the guy plenty of times. He's got good kickboxing, but he's very tentative. He's got very low volume. He's very, he's very hesitant to let it go. Um, he's undersized. I think he's put on his back foot easily. Um, and I think that's going to, you know, I think that's going to be golden for Shamil, who has great forward pressure. He's not going to have to, you know, go searching too far for sort of takedowns. I think they're going to come easy to him. Um, and when this fight hits the mat, man, I think just like most other times, I think Rosen Troy is going to get ran through on the mat. Curtis Blades is a good wrestler. Curtis Blades does not have a ton of finishes on the mat. You know, he's not, he doesn't have many subs, he doesn't ground and pound you. Shamil will look for the finish when he gets down um, to the mat. When you look at Royce and Stroik, I see people arguing the strength of schedule. It, that doesn't really mean too much to me when you lose every step up in competition. His wins aged horribly, not in the UFC anymore. Um, Sakai coming off a knockout loss. Dawkins coming off a knockout loss. Like he's, he's getting guys who are not even on the roster anymore who are coming off KO losses before they even fight him. Yeah, uh, truth be told, man, um, I was one of those guys who was a little bit scared to bet guys you have because of my luck in main events, period. All the dogs cashing lately. Um, was very happy to see you. You kind of reinforced how I was thinking as well. Both of us more than two units deep on guys you have. Um, I, I think he probably finishes the fight in the first two rounds, wins the first two rounds at a stupid high clip. And if you were to see things start heading south, like, I don't know. I, I feel like you're getting a nice live opportunity on Rose and Stroik to make some of your some of your cash back. But I'm on uh, I'm on Shamil. I like him with an under one and a half finish, man. Yeah, here's one other thing. I bet Shamil Gaziev by submission at plus four sixty against a, a Greg Velasco in the contender series, and mm-hmm. uh, we're getting like a three to one price tag uh, against Rose and Stroik, and we're both, you know saying the same thing. We think he's going to get it to the ground and dominate. We just saw Rosenstroik choked out in his last fight. And, um, you know, I think that there'll be plenty of opportunity for that to hit. And a plus 300, um, that might be another sprinkle. Hell, I, I hate to go too deep on Gaziev, given that mm-hmm. he is, uh, you know, still a little unproven. Um, but I like that three to one on on his submission prop. Yeah, I just realized as well that he's already 34 years old. So, um, I think the UFC kind of knows what they're doing here. They realize that he's 34 years old, which isn't really old in the heavyweight division, but they're like, you know, it, it's kind of now or never. And I think mm-hmm. as they're pushing him up the ranks, they're giving him correct matchmaking here, one that favors his style a, a whole lot. Yeah, great test, great name value, um, a, yeah. and a solid matchup for him stylistically. I agree. Yeah, man, fight cards, getting a little bit of crap online. It's only 11 fights, but – the last four fights have an undefeated fighter, a fifth undefeated fighter in Javid Basharat on the card. So it it's not horrible, truth be told, man. Some good fights on Saturday. I'm on the side that I'd rather have a, a shit UFC card than no UFC card, man. I really That's am. That's me too, man. I love fights on Saturday, especially when they start at 1230 Central Time in the oh, middle yes. of the day. Even yes. better, brother. Uh, 299 next week. Can't wait to get into those fights, start breaking them down. Uh, Be back as always next week to tip out some bets and some picks. See y'all next week. Peace.